everyone, it's Jack from Cultaholic.com, birthday edition. No, it's not my birthday today, it's next week, but because I'm off next week for a couple of days, then we've been celebrating my birthday today. We've had pizza in the office and everything. It's been, it's been a great Friday, even better than Fridays usually are, and you know how much I love Fridays. They are, of course, my favourite time of the week. But rest assured, even though I'm taking a few days off next week, I will be back in for next Friday as well. But before we get to that, we have this week to talk about in Wrestlers of the Week action. Let's see who's in my top 10 and who is, of course, my Wrestler of the Week. Ooh. We start things off, of course, with the honourable mentions. Our first honourable mention this week is Killian Dane, who lost his big street fight rematch with Matt Riddle on NXT. But at the same time, it was a good match. And I've really enjoyed this little push that Killian Dane's been on. And I just hope that it doesn't end. You know, he's done really well managing to, I guess, regain his relevance after the demise of Sanity for just no reason. I also have to mention Rey Mysterio. I really, really enjoyed the uh, Fatal 5-Way Elimination match on this week's Raw, and Rey Mysterio of course won, and towards the end, when he was really battling Bobby Roode down the stretch, I really got a sense of what Rey used to be like in those Elimination Chamber matches where he excelled so much, often losing against Edge in the final two, but this time he pulled out the victory in a big multi-man match, and even though there wasn't a big Chamber-like stipulation, you can still see why Rey is one of the best of all time, the best around, that sort of thing. And also, both of the Lucha Brothers as well, Phoenix and Pentagon, who did really well in the Battle of LA. I need to talk about the Battle of LA, right? So well done to the Lucha Brothers and all that, but let's explain a few things right now. The problem with the Battle of LA is that, well, one, it's the biggest independent tournament in the world of wrestling, but two, unless you're there, you're not gonna be able to get to see it until quite a long time after the event has actually taken place. But because it's such a monumental weekend of wrestling, I do feel like I have to take it into account for wrestlers of the week. I'm just gonna do what I did last year, which is basically I've scoured the internet for various different reviews. I've hopefully managed to get some sort of picture, some kind of general consensus of how good the tournament was and who stood out the most. And then I'm gonna plug that into my top 10. It's not ideal, it's not obviously my first hand opinion, but it's more of an amalgamation of all the critical, I guess, thoughts from around the wrestling world this weekend or last weekend and I just I just hope that it goes all right I'm sorry everyone it's not my fault mercifully though we start off with a non battle of LA participant in fact it's someone in NXT I think he has probably been in battles of LA before he certainly wrestled in PWG but now he is a WWE superstar and he is the new number one contender to Adam Cole's NXT championship and his name is Matt Riddle. Riddle did a really good job this week. He had the best match on this week's NXT against Killian Dane in that Street Fight rematch that I've already mentioned. And it was a really good match. Not one of the blow away matches of the week or anything, but still a really exciting encounter. And even though I think the result was kind of predictable because the winner would go up against a heel champion and you're probably gonna want the babyface to go up against him, I still think there was a nice little touch of storytelling after the match too. So after Riddle had secured the submission victory, Cole came out, they had a bit of a scuffle and he managed to tap out Adam Cole as well. Very interesting. Now initially, you might think, wow, they're really portraying Riddle as a strong contender for Adam Cole's championship. He's definitely going to beat him whenever they do battle against each other. I, however, this isn't my first wrestling show. I I've, been, I've been around the block a few times. This isn't my first grapsy rodeo. And I think, as many of you will also, that this is kind of a bait and switch. And that basically, Riddle's going to, I suppose come up short against Cole, maybe Cole will cheat in some way, maybe the Undisputed Era will get involved. And the reason for that is this, I just think that this whole storyline of the Era holding all of the gold has only just really begun, and they're going to want to keep that for at least one or two more takeovers. Do I think Riddle will eventually beat Cole in the future? Absolutely. Do I think he'll beat him at the first attempt? No. Do I think he's got one point this week on Wrestlers of the Week? You bet your bottom dollar, gents and ladies. Number nine this week, a man over in New Japan Pro Wrestling who's really had a very strong year. He's had several match of the year contenders and he's a really, really good wrestler as well. And he's made that jump from the junior division into the heavyweights. His name is Shingo Takagi. Quality of wrestling wise, this was a really good week for Shingo. He had a great match against Goto. Results wise, not a good week for Shingo, which is why he only gets two points despite having one of the standout matches because he came up short against the Chaos member. And I really think that this was an odd booking decision. Maybe it's another case of New Japan not wanting to push people too quickly. They often do slow burn kind of rises through the ranks. And I think this might be what's happening with Shingo here. I would have expected him to win given the role he's been on in 2019. But at the same time, I don't 
fully disagree with the decision, I just found it a bit of a curious one. With that being said though, you know that when you match up someone like Shingo against someone like Goto, they're really going to go hell for leather, they're really going to batter each other, and it was a, a fittingly and satisfyingly stiff encounter, and one that really, you know, swung back and forwards in that sort of classic New Japan style. So I really enjoyed it. Even though Shingo lost a pretty big match, I still feel like he deserves some pointage on wrestlers of the week. It's bloody Friday, Shingo. Get yourself a couple of points, mate. Get down the pub. Spend them on pints. Points cannot be exchanged for alcoholic beverages. Next up, number eight. Now we move from New Japan over to All Japan, and we're going to talk about the man named Zeus. Bless my soul. Zeus was on a roll. There's been an ongoing tournament in All Japan called the Royal Road Tournament. It hasn't really drawn as much critical acclaim as you might expect given some of the names in the tournament because there's some fantastic wrestlers in there, but it just hasn't quite clicked. It hasn't quite fired on all cylinders. But one highlight of the tournament was indeed Zeus. Maybe the most consistent and just the, the, the MVP of the tournament, basically. And I think he had a couple of very good matches this week. Zeus's first match was against Naoya Nomura. Uh, many people had this as their match of the tournament. And as, as for the matches that I've seen, I think I'm inclined to agree. I thought it was a very strong match. He also had a good match, not quite as good, but a decent match in the next round, getting knocked out by the ace of all Japan, Kento Miyahara. Kendo went on to lose in the finals, which I think is fine, but I mean, I don't think that Zeus should have particularly won this tournament because he's feuded with Kento quite a lot over the past couple of years, and I think that if he were to challenge him again, that would be a little bit silly, really. It would kind of be monotonous booking, so I understand why they've tried to freshen it up a bit at the top of the card, but at the same time, I do feel like Zeus's efforts have to be rewarded. Not only is he the head of the gods and sits atop his throne on Mount Olympus, but he's also a very, very large Japanese man who has really good wrestling matches in Asia. JPW. So if that's not worth three points, I don't actually know what is, to be honest. Number seven, get your bloody destinos out, everybody, because it's time to talk about the leader of LIJ and everyone's favourite, Tetsuya Naito. In a similar way to his stablemate, Shingo, actually, Naito had a disappointing week in terms of results, but a good one in terms of match quality, losing his Intercontinental Championship to the Bullet Club's Jay White. I don't think this is quite as curious a decision as maybe the Shingo one, because I think that Naito is so over, so popular, that he is one of those people who can just lose to anybody, and it, and it doesn't really affect his standing in the company. A lot of people are calling for Gato to really push Naito through the glass ceiling and give him a really long IWGP heavyweight title reign. He's obviously won it before, but it hasn't been kind of the definitive reign that the likes of Tanahashi and Okada have had. And given Naito's quality, and given his popularity, Popularity especially, you could argue that he deserves a little bit of a run as the, I guess, temporary ace of the division. But yes, Naito's match against Jay White was wonderful. Obviously, the crowd were really behind Naito. Jay White was healing it up big style but it was Naito who actually took the loss and, and lost his IC championship. Don't fear, Naito fans, because I think this is going to build to a huge, huge kind of storyline, maybe for Naito, but certainly involving multiple main eventers in New Japan when it comes to Wrestle Kingdom, which is, of course, now a mega event in January, and it's going to be even bigger than in previous years. Uh, there's been a lot of talk that maybe we'll see a double champion by the end of Wrestle Kingdom, basically someone who's won the heavyweight and someone who's won the Intercontinental belt, and then they're going to wrestle each other, and then, then there'll be a double champion. And I think that Naito could be regarded as one of the front runners for that crown. Moving on out to number six, sticking with New Japan, a man I've already mentioned on this list because he got a huge victory, to be honest. As disappointing as the loss was for Shingo, it was a big result for Hiroki Goto. I think I've, I think I've checked this right on my spreadsheet, but apparently this is the first time Goto's featured on Wrestlers of the Week in 2019. He got quite a few points in 2018. I'm not quite certain why he's taken a bit more of a back seat this time around. I think maybe a lot of his points from last year came in the G1 Climax, and even though he did have excellent matches in this year's G1, it just must have come in weeks where other people were having amazing matches all around him. The likes of Ishii, Osprey Okada, Moxley of course had a few bangers as well. So I can understand why Goto maybe hasn't featured quite as heavily, but I was surprised to see that I haven't given him any points at all in 2019 feel bad, really. Part of the reason I feel so bad, I guess, is because Goto is kind of the forgotten man of chaos in a stable surrounded by the likes of Okada, Osprey, Ishii. You can often forget how important and how great Goto is. You know, I was delighted, I think it was not this year's Wrestle Kingdom, but last year's, when he, he basically stole the show in that hair versus hair match against Minoru Suzuki. And now it's just a bit like, Goto never gets it done. He never wins the big one. And I think if he were to, everyone would be really happy for him. But at the same time, there's always going to be like five or six people who deserve it more just ahead of him. Maybe not deserve it more, but who are more relevant at the time. And it's really sad to see. And I would like to see Goto win the big one one day, but do I think it'll happen? No. 
No, I don't. But a great week for Godo, a great win over Shingo, and in the aftermath of the match, he also announced his intention to gun for the IC Championship. And I think he could win that, and it would be really nice if he did, but as I say, he's never going to win the big one, is he? If he does, I'll be buzzing for him, but... He's the nearly man. Moving on now to number five this week, and it's time to talk about our first battle of LA contestant on the list, which is a shame, because I don't really know what actually happened in these matches. I've read match reports, I know some of the big spots and everything, and I know how good people generally seem to find each match, but I haven't watched it myself. But anyway, we're gonna talk about Jungle Boy. Jungle Boy was knocked out in the first round, actually, so it's quite strange that he's got so many points. He's appearing in fifth on this week's league table, but at the same time, he had a really good match. Many people are describing it, actually, as the best match of Jungle Boy's career so far. He matched up against Jake Atlas, a California-based wrestler that I'm not too familiar with, to be honest, but it sounded like he also had a very impressive weekend. Uh, but it seemed like Jungle Boy, even though he lost in the first round, still, I mean, of course, he was massively over, given now the AEW connection and everything, but it seemed like he really did himself justice in the ring, too, which is great to hear, and I hope that it, you know, I hope it continues. And I really want him and Luchasaurus to bloody win the tag team tournament in AEW. But I just, I just don't think, I just don't think they will. Looking at the brackets, but I'd love for them to. I think they are my favourites to win the whole thing in my heart. My head says like the Lucha Brothers or the Bucks or somebody, but Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus, come on, lads. Next up, number four, the new IWGP Intercontinental Champion, the Switchblade, and the most despicable heel in all of wrestling today. Jay White. Not only has Jay White won more gold in what is turning out to be a very fruitful year for him, he also defeated one of the biggest stars in New Japan in the form of Tetsuya Naito. It's not the only big scalp that Jay White's claimed recently. He's obviously beaten Tanahashi and Okada in recent, well, the past year or so. But also, he just seems to be really becoming a well-rounded heel and a well-rounded performer too. A lot of people accused him of being a little bit bland and over-pushed when he first started to rise through the ranks in New Japan, but I think now he's starting to really justify himself as worthy of that position on the card. Honestly, I think the turning point for Jay White was the G1 Climax, especially the semi-finals and that final against Kota Ibushi, which was just the classic heel versus babyface story, and he played the heel role to an absolute T. And this, if this is what's coming off the back of that excellent G1 run that he had, if this is the reward for it, an IC title reign, then I am fully behind it. I think that he fully deserves it, and I'm excited to see what comes of it too. I think he'll probably beat Goto if that match does occur, and then maybe he'll carry it into Wrestle Kingdom. Who knows? Number three this week, I'm one of my personal favorite junior kind of lucha style wrestlers around today, Dragon Lee. Dragon Lee, from the sounds of it, because I didn't see his bloody matches, but apparently had a really, really good run in the Battle of LA, getting all the way to the semi-finals, defeating Ray Horus, defeating Jake Atlas, and then losing to Bandido in the semi-finals. And it really sounds like Dragon Lee really grew into himself as the tournament progressed, basically from what I read on SoCal Uncensored, the website, not the stable in AEW, but from what I read on that website, it was like his first match against Ray Horus was okay. And then he realized, oh my God, everyone else is pulling some crazy stuff out the bag this weekend. I need to really step up my game. And then it sounds like he absolutely did so, delivering two of the best received matches of the entire weekend against, well, as I've said, against Bandido and also against Jake Atlas. The one against Bandido is apparently the match of the weekend in many people's view. I would be inclined to agree without seeing it, just from the names involved. I think they would match up really, really well with each other, and they'd probably do some crazy stuff. Apparently Bandido nearly hit his shins on a balcony while doing a big moonsault or something, but we hadn't seen it, so... But well done, Dragon Lee. I'm sure you were great. I'm sure you were really good, mate. This week's so annoying. Next up, number two. I've mentioned him already. I'd, I'd, I'd heard the name before, but I wasn't too familiar with him, but he's got nine points straight away on Wrestlers of the Week. His first appearance ever it's Jake Atlas. Now, from what I've read and from all the reviews that I've seen, Jake Atlas was apparently the most over guy of the entire weekend. The crowd were apparently popping huge for his entrances every single night, and he basically performed really well too. He seems to be, from what I can tell, uh, a really easy to cheer baby face. He seems to be a proper, you know, good guy in wrestling, basically. His gimmick appears to be very LGBT positive, which is great to see, and also he backs it all up in the ring as well. He seems like a fantastic in-ring talent, and one who I guess has a bright future ahead of him. I hope so anyway, given the reports that I've read. He was knocked out after two matches, but his two matches were two of the best of the entire weekend. So there was that first round match against Jungle Boy, which many people again are calling the best match of Jungle Boy's entire career, and then the second match against Dragon Lee, which was again meant to be many people's match of the weekend. But a lot of people were saying it was either that one or the Bandido one, but out of those two singles matches, apparently they were kind of competing for the crown of Bowler, Bowler 2019. I know they said Bowler 19, which would have been factually incorrect. So well done, Jake Atlas. A great week for him. Nine points straight away on Wrestlers of the Week, but not quite enough 
to take the crown. And that goes to a man who I think won Wrestlers of the Week this same time last year, and he's won it again two years in a row. Bit like how Gargano always wins over WrestleMania weekend, over Bowler weekend, it seems like number one is always Bandido. So Bandido's journey through the tournament was basically, well, the story goes back to last year's tournament when he lost in the final and everybody really wanted him to win. And then there were questions of like, are they gonna actually pull the trigger on Bandido this year around and give him that big tournament win that everybody wants him to get? And it turns out that's exactly what they did. Sometimes the best booking is the most sensible and most obvious option and even though you're not swerving the crowd or anything it's still really popular and comes off really well so I can't complain about the booking at all and apparently his matches were great. His first match was against Puma King then he defeated the much larger Brody King who apparently had a bit of a lucha match with him because Brody King's one of those freaks in wrestling who's huge but also moves like a luchador which just seems unfair to be honest with you. Then Bandido had that wonderful semi-final match that we've already talked about with Dragon Lee which I really really need to check out when it becomes available and then moved on to the final. Now if you're not familiar with the Battle of LA the final is a triple threat. There's been kind of a triple bracket and then the three winners of the three semi-finals will progress into the main event. That is an elimination style three-way match and the competitors this year were Bandido, Jonathan Gresham and David Starr. And a shout out to Jonathan Gresham as well who was apparently suffering from quite a bad illness over the weekend but kind of dragged himself through and go all the way to the final which is really an excellent effort on Gresham's part and a testament to his professionalism. But this is all about Bandido. David Starr is like the biggest heel in PWG at the minute. Nobody wanted him to win. And then I think he was eliminated first. And then from what I've heard, Bandido then defeated Gresham to just a monstrous reception. So 10 points for Bandido. He is my wrestler of the week. Uh, for, for the second time, actually. Once in 2018 and once in 2019. Apologies again for not having seen a lot of the matches I've been talking about. But it's the only way to really do it. And I will be checking out for certain uh, this event when it becomes available because it just sounds fantastic from everything that I've read and heard. When I was in Las Vegas earlier this year I was lucky enough to meet quite a few of the PWG regulars and their passion and enthusiasm for that promotion really shines through. It does seem like a special thing in the pro wrestling landscape. Now on to the league table. The top four remain unchanged but Jay White has jumped up to fifth passing Johnny Gargano, Kenzo Miyahara and big 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 Volta. Uh, a little bit further down Tetsuya Naito and Shingo Takagi are edging up the table a little bit in the name of LIJ and Dragon Lee has shot past various people up into 15th after an excellent weekend in California and there's Bandido, the king I guess of the weekend, sneaking up into the top 25. Thanks very much for watching and let us know what you think in the comments section down below. You can follow Cultaholic on Twitter at Cultaholic and on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Cultaholic. If you enjoy what we do, then please do check out our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic, where you can pledge. And don't forget, of course, most importantly of all, to hit subscribe and to join us.